things are different. I don't think we're going to see the Genesis 6 repeated in the sense that we're going to have these really tall giants. It's been documented yeah, by survivors, by people in the UFO area. These individuals are walking among us and they look like us and they could pass for humans and they're not fully human. It's not like the Genesis 6. It is because it's a manipulation of the ge a genetic code and it is the enemy's tactic to bring about a large army to fight God, to bring the birth of the Antichrist and a one world government on the scene. But it's not, it, it's more covert. Welcome to the Days of Noah podcast, where we talk all things biblical, supernatural, and strange. This week, we're going to cover a few different topics. We're going to review Blurry Creatures episode number 52 with Dr. Laura Sanger. But prior to that, we're going to discuss a bit about trafficking, deep underground military bases, and really how the plan of the enemy to defile the human genome and thwart God in the end times is all part of the plan of how everything is going to play out and what is our role in all of that. And right at the beginning here, you're going to hear us discuss about why we canceled having a certain guest on our show a few weeks ago. Um, we touched on this a little bit in the last few weeks, but basically this person was kind of blending New Age and Christianity and going off kind of solo in a way to try to fight against uh, human trafficking, which is totally noble of him. But we had some reservations about kind of his tactics and what he was into. So you'll hear us kind of discuss uh, the background of why we didn't have him on our show. Explaining to uh, to Don kind of the conversation leading up to um, not having that guest on. I can't even remember his first name. Oh yes, uh, and Steve, kind of kind yeah. of what what I was researching, what I was finding, and how we came to that conclusion. Yep, yep. And I actually just listened to have anything you want to. Yeah, do you have anything you want to uh, say to? On that subject, sure, actually, because um, yeah, as uh, as it turns out, I um, had some time yesterday at work to <clears throat> to listen to a bunch of things while I was working, and one of the things I had on my list was to listen to an episode of him on a different show. Uh, did you ever listen to that Rumble one, that interview that I gave you? Most of it, I did, yeah. But yeah, I listened to his appearance on a different podcast, um, and it was striking how egocentric it was, how um, new agey spiritual it was. I mean, the so the host seems to have a similar background, although not a Christian, as Jed, as far as experimenting with... Um, psychotropics and stuff like that dmt and things like that and okay. i and, didn't realize that yeah well so well i'm i'm not talking about steve i'm talking about the host of this show that had him on oh okay oh, oh. well well but him too but but steve was like yeah i don't do it anymore but go for it man you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's it really was all about like I've got this job to do and I'm going to go for it. And it's nothing about, it's like the polar opposite of what Tim Benz talked about, about gaining God's heart on an issue, you know, and, and he seriously was talking about, okay, first we're going to go after the, right now we're fighting the Dracos and then 
Who's that, the Drake house? Um, one of the creatures underground. And then, oh. and then we're going to fight the Greys. And then we're going to go after, I forget the next one. The, um, and then, we're, and then Lilith, that's the big one. That's like the boss of the game. And I'm like, Lilith is the boss. What about Satan? Maybe is the boss. And where is he getting this info? Well, exactly. And, and why does he think that, that he can actually like overcome uh, just by human means? Oh, we're going to take out these creatures as if the whole Nephilim agenda, satanic, you know, one world government that's coming, everything that's coming in the final days isn't going to play out. And, and no matter what we're doing, we're not going to, by human means, be able to stop it. Exactly. So, like, it's, it's God's permit. Not, I was trying to remember the wills. His permissive will. Sure. Yep. But his basically his divine will, whatever the truths of the Bible or prophecies that are written, like the rise of the Antichrist, right? Yeah. We. There's no praying, no fasting, no any kind of warfare that we could possibly do to prevent that. It has to happen and in a certain way it, that God allows, mm-hmm. and then he's going to defeat him, right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we sit back and do nothing. We don't, we don't push back against evil. We don't expose evil. But I think all of that ultimately is part of the plan of why... Christians will be persecuted and marginalized and shamed and <clears throat> all that sort of stuff is because we don't we don't put up with it. But again, like you said, by human means, we are not going to prevent ultimately the the sin of the world coming to its fullness in the end times. Well, and the other thing, and I, I said it to Don, I think I told you when we were having this discussion last is if he's gathering this information by drugs or by new age, you Astral know, projection. basically by de- yeah, by interacting with demons yep. and all that type of stuff, how do you not know that you're not being deceived? So the enemy is going to expose the evil that he's doing by using his own tools? It makes no sense. I think you're just setting yourself up for deception, deception, deception. It's a form now, of div- you, divination. Yeah. Did you have um, that link that I sent you that? Did you look into any of that? Um, You cut out for a sec there. The link that you sent me about what, which one? Underground, the Underground Railroad, the, the oh. website. Well, no. So that was about the, um, is that about the movie that's coming out or is that separate? It is, but it's uh, it's it's not just a movie. It's what they're it's doing. A nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization. These guys used to work for the government, and they have a nonprofit. And I think they got special forces backgrounds. Uh, at least the founder does. And they they are going are all around the world and rescuing um, human traffic wow. victims. Wow, you know and. So there was an interview, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Tim Aberino. Okay. Yeah, it was him talking on Blurry Creatures, and he was talking to Nate and Luke uh, about this movie, and and how Jim, uh, I can't pronounce his last Uh, name. Kazeevil. Yeah, how he was going to, he he was picked by the founder of this railroad organization, like... I want to do a documentary about this story, this rescue. And people are, they hear the story. They're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I was like, who's going to be the lead? Well, I want Jim. They're like, there's no way you're going to get him. Well, somehow they were able to track him down and show him the transcripts, you know? And he's like, I'm in. Yeah. So he accepted the role. And then part of his, uh, his, training prior to actually doing the filming is he went undercover with these guys to South America and different parts and actually participated in some of the raids and stuff. Hmm. So Tim Averina was telling Nate and Luke about 
Jim having a discussion, like he was at a, a conference, and let's say it was a UFO conference, or, you know, we'll just pick a conference, a yep. title. Okay. And he happens to bring up the film, he happens to bring up what he was doing, and he slipped up, and the reason Tim Moreno feels like he slipped up, because he said the term dumbs. Oh. And he kind of paused, and then he realized who the audience was, and it's being recorded, and it's like, Maybe I shouldn't go there. And he kind of <laughs> backtracked and then talked about some other things. So I would be more interested, you know, at looking at people that are Christ centered or, you know, not using new age methods, but, you know, honest, honest methods or better yet, you know, godly methods and then talking to survivors and, you know, getting getting the truth out that way about the underground and the stuff that's going on. Not new age. Absolutely. Methods. And, and the, here's the other thing that struck me when I listened to <clears throat> his appearance on this show, um, which I forget. The name of the show was like Rise of the Chessmen or I forget what it was called. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the other thing that struck me is if he is so focused on being the leader of this so-called movement, you know, Occupy the Getty, which I think is admirable if if seriously, you know, that stuff is going on. Mo- most of the show was not talking about that. Like, it was just all over the place and not focused. <clears throat> um, like, I don't know, it was just ramblings. And it's like, if you've got this thing that's like burning in your heart that you want to do something good, then lay out the case. You know, he's been at this a number of years, apparently. Lay out the case and say, this is what we're doing and this is what... It was just all over. And, yeah, and then he's, you know, talking... I mean, at one point the host of the show said, "Um, you know, God, God is everything and all like that, and... Even even Steve was like, yeah, and we're part of God too, and that's I reject, you know, the the good versus evil. Like it's all part of the same stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And yet, you know, he's gonna he's gonna use like cr- Christian words in the email back and forth to me. So anyway, yeah, it was a good decision to to do that. I can definitely see that in hindsight now. Right. I would love to have somebody from the the railroad. Um, organization. Um, I message. Share their message. Yeah. So, uh, Don, uh, again, I I could send it maybe to the group the the trailer of that film, and uh, the film has been done. It's just ready for distribution and to be you know consumed by the consumer. And you what, know? and that what I was mean, that called? Sound of Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom. And the problem they were having, and they had the same problem with the Passion of the Christ was yeah nobody wants even to fund though it. they had the big names and they had the um mel gibson directing and producing and all that type of stuff it was what movie organization is going to distribute this and get it out to the masses get it in the theaters right. and um they struggled with both of those films yep. and there was delays and there's the covid and all that type of stuff and then the most recent news blast i got was it was a christian organization the the christian movie that's in the theaters right now that was about moses um son of my only son or something like that Mm -hmm. um they actually it was crowdfunded so it was basically i think that's how that christian organization works is they they maybe have their own resources but then they get it out to the christian church you know the Mm -hmm. believers and they're like hey you want to see this you know We'll take your 20 bucks, your 50 bucks, whatever you want to contribute, and we'll get it out in the theaters, no matter how many, you know, they can get. And uh, with that film, they, uh, I think they got it out. They, they didn't get it out to every theater. They got it out over a thousand. And it was in the top three, you know, grossing the first weekend it was out. So wow. they picked up the the call and the torch with the sound of freedom one. And it's supposed to come out later this year. Um, That'd be a good so, watch. Yeah. I, I'd like to dedicate more time to this and we can certainly 
pepper it here and there in different episodes in the future. But um, yeah, there there is a worldwide conglomerate of keeping these sort of tactics, these sort of things going on in underground bases, the satanic ritual abuse, the pedophilia, the sacrifice, all that stuff is so pervasive. I'm reading a book from a survivor named Fiona Barnett. She was from Australia and she was trafficked all around and, you know, you know, trafficked as a child, going to, you know, parties and mansions of politicians and, and all sorts of stuff. And it's it's really making me see how pervasive it is. And so it's no surprise when that you, they're blocked. That they're blocked, that they that you know certain investigatory groups, police groups turn a blind eye or Hollywood doesn't want to fund a, a theater, you know, or a showing or in on it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all part of it, you know, and, and like the, uh, the operation railroad, they document and they talk about it's, you know, how bad slavery was like slavery, 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 you know, like, in the cotton fields type of slavery. Yeah. You know, the slavery, the sex trade is as bad, if not worse than that. It is like the number one crime in the world as far right. as money and victims. And, and it's more it's way worse than the other type of slavery. Was. Yeah. And, and it's um, one, one stat I saw is, is it's like 80% of the revenue. So 20% is like the drug trade and 80 percent is the human traffic so and the big banks launder the money and they have front organizations as well to make everything look legit but that's another reason why they don't want to legalize drugs because they're more valuable when they're illegal and you can keep it off the books so if you have legal tax revenue coming in from legal drug sales it's a lot harder to keep that off the books if you have dark money which they've got a ton of, then you can do most whatever you want. Of, most with of the, tr- like, like you know, the, the, we talk about inflation. We talk about the trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve has printed and that type of stuff. Just in the last decade or two, the majority of those U.S. dollars are outside of the U.S. Right. Yeah. It's- so, and and I don't really understand how an how that kind of black market type of activity. I, cash is perfect for that because it's you can't track it. Yeah, right. It's off the books, like you said. But if if the push is to go digital, where there's more control, like a C, CBDC, central bank digital currency. Yeah, you know how how would this unless unless because they're centrally controlling the digital currency. You know, it's just not that part of the ledger is just not going to be tracked by the public because yeah. the governments are controlling and yeah. they're corrupt. Yeah, they'd probably have so, two sets of books or something like that. But yeah, know. when you it it's I'm not going to be able to sum it up here in a minute or two. But as I'm thinking of it, it is the banking system. It is world governments, big business. Um. All, all of the institutions of power and media and influence are all part of the Luciferian elite. And at the very top is the, the satanic rituals, the, the hybridization breeding, um, you know, the pedophilia, the snuff films, all of that stuff is at the top, and the worst then there, of the worst. and then there's then there's the slightly lesser who are just into, you know, maybe not the killing, but they're into all the other stuff. So the way uh, Fiona Barnett laid it out was: there's at the bottom, there's street gangs, and then there's like mafia, and that, and and on up, you know, there's three more levels. I forget the other three levels, but. Um, and the CIA is basically the one that's running cover for 
um, governments. They're the ones trafficking. They're the ones. I mean, uh, Don, did you ever see that movie with uh, Jeremy Renner based on the journalist um, Kill the Messenger? I, I did one. not. Oh, you guys got to see that. So it's based on the on the true story of. Um, I forget the the journalist's name, but anyway, he was. Um, try not to burn the bacon. Try not to burn the bacon. Uh, yeah. So he was a journalist that uncovered. We're not recording yet, are we? I'm just. I, I'm letting it roll. Well, hey, oh. we might we might use some of this. It's good. <laughs> uh, we might use it all. Uh, so so he plays um, this journalist. And he uncovers that the CIA is the ones that have been uh, flying the drugs into the U.S. Um, in fact, one story I heard is that uh, the reason the Clintons rose to power was when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. Um, George Bush Sr., who you remember used to be the CIA director, um, needed a place to fly fly the drugs in and bill was happy to give him a an airstrip um out of the way in arkansas to be able to do that anyway um if you guys have ever heard of the the infamous um drug kingpin uh highway rick ross um i think i first heard of him on with infowars and alex jones because i think he interviewed him a couple times so he was like doing a million dollars a day or a week, I forget what it was, of of cocaine sales in uh Cal- California. And I think I think Compton area primarily. But so Rick Ross said in an interview, he said, you know, back in the day when I was growing up, you used to be able to walk your kids down the street in Compton, you know, at night or whatever. It was a, it was family neighborhoods. It was safe. And then all these drugs show up and like totally ruin our, our families, our societies, our race, you know, all of that. And, um, and Rick Ross was like, I, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting caught. And that's and he was able to find out that he was getting supplied through the CIA. And then when he started to then when he started to talk about it, then they threw him in jail. And so this journalist uncovers this stuff and starts reporting on it. And it's a really good movie too, Kill the Messenger. Um, and and he gets killed, of course. But okay, that was very long winded to say, like. They use the money to fund what they need, and they get it from drugs. They get it from human trafficking. You know, basically all the governments are in on it. All the all the elites, all the you know people in power. Like you don't you don't rise to prominence uh, in in business in Hollywood and these in media and so on without being part of that. And um, I think it was in the in uh, Fiona's book, uh, which is called Eyes Wide Open. Which, by the way, I went to Amazon to buy the Kindle, and it says it's not available. They they have a Kindle book, and it says it's not available. But it's it's available for free on PDF. You can just Google it. But anyway, in the book, she says that, um, um, and I think this was an estimate from so she's talking about um a former nypd um higher up who had been working on tracking these trafficking situations for decades like his whole career and he said that about it's about 70 percent of top politicians are compromised yeah so they they put them in situations, they lure them in situations, and then they they photograph and video it, and that's how they control them. I've heard of that before. Yep. So it is a um, incredibly pervasive thing. So yeah, we, yeah, let's segue that to the subject that we're wanting to talk sure. about today, which was the uh, episode. 42? Was uh, it? Episode 52. 52, 52, 52 with 52, Dr. Laura, Laura Sanger. Sanger. Yeah. 
And obviously her book on the Nephilim and its links to the Federal Reserve, it ties into all this stuff that we're talking about, Mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to control and money and slavery, um, manipulation, all that type of stuff. Right. So, um, yeah. Where did you, where did you want to start with that episode that, that kind of stood out to you? Well, maybe we should, maybe we should continue along, uh, similar lines of where we, where we're, where we were talking because some of the other stuff that that she brought up here and there in that episode I think is kind of interesting and fascinating but it's not necessarily maybe tied in with with what we were talking about so maybe we could split that up for another another show but let me just let me just give like a kind of a brief overview of some topics that I pulled from there yeah so episode 52 of blurry creatures This was Dr. Laura Sanger's third appearance with them, I believe. And she covered a lot of ground on this one. So she talked about mind control and manipulation of the masses. Um, Kind of the reward, punishment, shaming. You know, we saw a lot of that in COVID with, you know, pressure to get vaccinated or, or wear a mask or whatever. Um, she talked about some of the transhumanist things that are going on where they discovered this God gene um, that supposedly allows <clears throat> allows us to be able to connect spiritually. Um, she talked a bit about uh, the Heart Math Institute where they're doing a lot of research. This, So again, I, we won't get into a lot of this maybe now, but fascinating stuff about the magnetic field that our hearts give off. Um, and one article that one definitely stood out to me. I was actually listening to that yesterday. I was in the car with my wife and, and, and so let's just kind of dig into that really quick. So the heart Institute was talking about that. There was a study that showed there was a magnetic field around all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. And that magnetic field went out from us in almost like a, a five foot diameter you know, around us, you know, just, just this field, electrical right. field. Yep. And then if you think back to the time of COVID and there's still remnants of it in stores and malls and that type of stuff, those little stickers they put on the ground, you know, safe, you know, what are the, what was it called? Uh, uh, six foot, uh, to, to, to the, s- the safety bubble. Slow yeah. the, six, Six, six foot to slow the spread or something, you right? Know? And um, safe distancing, that's the word I was looking oh, for. Oh, right, yeah, social social distancing. Gosh, has it social been that distance. long we forgot the term? <laughs> right, well, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, it's a good but, thing. Um, but she, her point in that was talking, she was going down the path of fear and isolation, and when you're, when you're fearful and you're isolated, you're easily more easily controlled and manipulated and deceived. Right. And if you think about even the interaction of one another, you know, they didn't even want us in that bubble, that five foot, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they want, they got they purposely, it seemed like put us outside that five foot magnetic connection that we're, where we're bonding, you know, where it's a healthy space for us to interact with one another. So, yeah, she. I think. I think in that episode, she did talk a lot about how control was used, fear was used. Um, her definition and in going into pandemic, and then the the demon god from mythology. Yes, I did a little. Pan. I did a little research on that. So let's let's dig into that, and then some of what you were just talking about. And Don, feel free to jump in whenever. If you got anything, oh, anything you want to add or, or ask. So, um, yeah, so I did a little looking into the HeartMath Institute, really fascinating research. And then I also found an article on Psychology Today. So get this. This just blew my mind. Um, okay, so it says when, you're, when we're being formed in, in the womb, the heart beats before the brain forms. When the brain is dead, the heart continues to beat as long as it has oxygen. And it says, in fact, the heart has 40,000 neurons and the ability to process, learn, and remember. Like, what? Our heart has neurons like our brain does? And, well, and, in, in, 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, one thing I was going to add is that if you go down into the our anatomy and into our intestines and things like that, there's a lot of emotional issues that can actually come from that. Oh, totally. Or it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, the gut is called our, our second brain because it's actually, you know, that's our immune system. And mo- most of our serotonin is produced from our gut, not from our brain. So having that healthy bacteria is key. Um, yeah, so I've, I've kind of read about that, just like you said, Don, um, you know, and looking into different kind of natural health things. But I had never heard about the heart having its own neurons and stuff like that. I mean, we kind of always say, oh, you know, it's from the heart or in your heart. Your heart is desperately wicked, like the Bible says. And we kind of think of that figuratively, like, okay, well, they really mean the brain or they really mean the subconscious. And now there's research saying that, no, there's actually a connection <laughs> to thinking and emotion, and that's that's crazy. Um. Okay, Luke, you were talking about control and some of that stuff. So, and I, I wasn't able to find like a an, an article or a source, but Dr. Laura briefly mentioned that it was something they've been doing for over a hundred years about, um, manipulating the masses in in different ways, behavioral behavioral modification. It made me think of uh, Edward Bernays. Do you guys know that name? Back in like the forties, I want to say. That one doesn't ring a bell. But I was just thinking when you're talking about manipulation and control, um, we should do a a, a deeper dive um, into mind control. Okay. Whether it's specifically MK Ultra. Oh, right. There's a lot on that, especially with uh, the Freedom of Information Act and stuff that the hearings that took place in Congress. I think it was back in the seventies. Uh, what the CIA was doing. Okay. So there's even public information just on that specific a- aspect of, of their study of uh, mind control. You know, um, th- they even made a movie about it. The men who stare at goats trying to use psychopathic new age, you know, type of methods to control things. And, and, it does make me think of DARPA and other government agencies that are researching this stuff. And it's like the information that we know um, is, is basically old technology. You know, the, the cutting edge stuff, they're not going to let us. Oh, exactly. We're not, we're not going to be able to see. I, I had, a, um, I had a, past, a pastor tell me years ago when I was talking about some conspiratorial stuff. And he's like, uh, you know, this kind of stuff makes my baloney radar go off. And he's like, he says, I, I love technology. Like, I love Apple products, he says. And they can't hardly contain the information of a new phone coming out, you know, try to keep that under wraps. Like, he was basically making the point that how in the world could <clears throat> technology be way more advanced? And I was like... That's just so naive to think, well, you know. Well, and I have a good argument. I have a good argument against that. Yeah. The the S the SR seventy one Blackbird uh, was actually flying in nineteen sixty seven. Okay. And and so I mean that that's a long time ago when when you're thinking about uh, spy planes and when you're thinking about the technology that went into that uh, specific plane. The faster it goes, the faster it can go. And that's that's kind of my anchor when it comes to technology, because I I think a lot of the technology um, goof ups and things like that, when they have bugs or when something's not working, I think that those are planned. I think that they're set up that way. Um, Certain bugs, you know, shut down a certain part of your phone. Now you got to get a new phone, you know, just kind of stuff like just stuff like that. Um, I don't have any I don't have any direct evidence of that, but uh, I do remember when my um, Apple iPhone six, all of a sudden did it, it, uh, took an upgrade and basically took up all my memory, oh. you know? So, I mean, everything, you know, you know, the, the, there's this little line that says, you know, uh, other, 
Yeah. You know, yeah. Other was like covering my entire, you know, all my gigs. Oh my so, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we've talked a bit about the technology that, um, you know, Nephilim technology, technology of the Watchers from, from back in Genesis 6. And then, you know, even whispers of our government working with uh, the Greys in exchange for technology. So there's there's quite a lot of of that sort of thing going on. And, and you know, Joe Rogan, I think, has mentioned it too, just the explosion of... of uh, advancements the last 150 years is unprecedented um yeah so but let's circle back to kind of what luke you were saying about um manipulation and mind control so you know what they did and during covid we all saw was oh you'll be able to travel you'll be able to get a free free meal free beer if you do this or and and so that that whole conditioning towards, oh, if I want freedom, then I need to do this. And um, made me think of the the Ben Franklin quote, which I, I guess is, it's taken out of context, but I think it's, I think it's still valid, you know, that, that if we're willing to trade uh, freedom for, for safety, then we deserve neither. And, um, and then also the Hegelian dialectic, she mentions. She mentions. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't really understand that. I, I need to research that a little bit more. But when you what you the statement you just made, it made me think of. Yeah, how they, I know they people joked around or maybe not jokingly said called it a pandemic versus a pa- pandemic. You know that it was a planned thing, but you. Or, or the other saying that is popular, um, never let a good crisis go to waste. So whatever your thinking is with 9-11 or COVID situation, the point is when there was these big incidents, they governments of the world, specifically even the U.S. taking the lead, took advantage of those and passed certain laws, right? You look at the Patriot Act, you look at the things that they're trying to implement. Even now, it was almost that time of the COVID crisis and the lockdowns and stuff, they realized what things that were effective and what things weren't, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've heard that bill that is being proposed that basically would, in the next pandemic, give power to the World Health Organization and they would be able to come to the United States and step all over our state rights and federal mm-hmm. rights. If if we were to, as a country, uh, uh, sign this agreement, essentially, it's like really. And then there was another one that's being proposed even recently, and it deal it tied into the whole TikTok thing. You know, wherever your stance is with that particular app or Chinese and stuff. The the more importantly, I think is if they can monitor what you have and ban what you have, you're you're restricting freedoms. And then tied to that bill was, if you had a VPN and you tried to go private, you could be facing multiple decades in prison. Mike Horker was just telling me about that last week because he he keeps an eye on, you know, AI and, and stuff like that. Um, technology stuff that they're using against us, right? Yeah, that's that's crazy, frightening. Um, but God's still on the throne. We don't want to get too far down the fear fear hole, right? But um, okay, let's go back but to the, I think, yeah. But ahead. I think it kind of goes it kind of goes with it, as bad as those things are, and you got to have a balance in your mind, especially as believers, that fear doesn't overwhelm you. And you're right; you got to understand that God is in control. And God is allowing these things, like we were saying in the beginning, some of these things, even though we might try to fight it at a local level or whatever, they have to come to pass to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible. Yeah, and I, right? think, I think the fighting is part of it, too. I think that's where, that's where they separate. Well, like we've talked about, they find the ones that can um, will, will go along with things, right? 
and the ones that won't. I know Steve Quayle, um, you know, I take it with a grain of salt because some of the stuff he talks about is pretty fantastical. But I, re- but I do respect him, and I think that he's he's probably being honest and truthful. But he says he's got a lot of military contacts, and they, you know, they have a list. They have a red red list, blue list, green list. And the green list are the people that are, are they know are going to go along with the program. And the blue list are, you know, unfortunately the, um, you know, the police, the military, those that are useful to, to carry out what they need carry it out, um, but, you know, may or may not be useful down the road. And then the red list are the ones that they know, you know, think of the no-fly list, but times 100. The, the ones that they know are, aren't going to stand for it and need to be taken out. Um, let's talk about the uh, Hegelian dialectic. So this was this guy, Hegel, I think in, is it Germany? I don't know. I, I'm not going to be able to get the, the, the source of it there. But, okay, here's, here's the basic thing to understand about it. Uh, problem, reaction, solution. So they devise a problem or create a problem, like you said, Luke, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And then they, they want to get a prescribed reaction from the public, and they already have the predetermined solution in mind for that reaction from the public in order to push that agenda. So... If they create, you know, some sort of situation of terrorism, then the public reacts in a predictable way, and then uh, they come in with the solution and say, oh, well, we've got to create these new laws or this new institution. We've got to take away this freedom in order to combat this. And uh, so the reason I brought up Edward Bernays, um, he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and uh, Bernays was uh, the father of of PR, public relations, or propaganda. So he was um, very skillful at uh, being able to manipulate uh, the public's perception of things. And he was hired by um, a cigarette company to, to market cigarettes to women because... At the time, very few women smoked. And so he came up with a very successful marketing campaign um, to make it appealing. Um, You think of the, you know, you're making bacon this morning, Luke. Uh, Bacon and eggs, right? Okay, so that apparently was a uh, a breakfast, you know, back in the 1800s when people ate a ton because they had to work out in the fields all day. But that kind of fell out of favor, you know, and um, he was hired to to make that popular again, and that's the reason why we have it today as a popular breakfast food. So they know how to to manipulate the masses. I mean, even fluoride. Um, you know, this is another rabbit hole, but I think it's a good example. Okay, fluoride is one of the most toxic substances. It's a neurotoxin. You know, a Harvard study showing that it drops the IQ in, in children that, that drink it in their tap water. Okay, so this is a byproduct from the fertilizer and the aluminum industries. And it's so toxic when it's concentrated as a byproduct of, of, of what they produce, manufacturing, that it'll eat through glass, eat through lead. It's, it's extremely expensive to dispose of. And I don't know if it was Edward Bernays or not, but um, those industries hired people to um, convince the public that it was good for them, that it would help their teeth. And so they dumped it in our drinking water, and they've been doing it ever since. And it's literally industrial. It's not even food grade. It's industrial waste that they put in our water. And they say it's good for us. Well, Fluoride is not a nutrient we need. It's not vitamin C. It's not, you know, vitamin D. It's a chemical. And, um, but again, this is just giving an example of how, you know, you can 
manipulate the public or how, you know, the Heart Association used to recommend trans fats, you know, or doctors used to. I got, I got another one for you. Yeah, doctors recommend smoking. These, yeah. Yeah, I got uh, sugar. You can look up, and I think I even got it on my my iPad. I had um, snapped a photo of it, you know, and uh, it was old black and white advertisements on sugar. And it was talking about how it how it boosts your energy. It was showing at showing it with athletes and and how you can lose weight with sugar, <laughs> you know, to satisfy your cravings. And it's like it's like really wow, you know. It, it's it, and you could you could pick all these different things, whether it's margarine or you know fats and that type of stuff. It's like, do they really know what this stuff was and just deceive us? I mean, and then the truth came out later. Now, obviously, when it comes to smoking and like you're talking the targeting the, the women or the children, that ended up going to lawsuits and, um, and uh, you know that was that was a big ordeal. But yeah, back to the controlling and the propaganda and the the mind control. Um, a lot of those tactics really seem to come on the scene during World War II, the tactics of the Nazis and stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised that after the war was over, Operation Paperclip were taking in these elite members of the Nazi party that are specializing in these different industries. That's, that's when they got into American business. They got into American government. And then those same tactics were being deployed in these other examples that we're giving. Yep. I think even Joseph Go- Gables, Goebbels, um, Hitler's propaganda minister, uh, learned from the things that Edward Bernays was discovering. So, so this, is, this is mind control on a, on a mass scale in kind of an indirect way, right? This is... We're, we're, just to separate the categories from like someone who like you mentioned MK Ultra or or a Manchurian candidate or someone with DID um multiple personality who through trauma, you know, you split their personality and you're able to control in different ways. Those are more um direct focused mind control techniques, but we're talking about at least for now the Kind of the mass manipulation. Have you guys ever heard of the term the Overton window? Is that familiar at all? I haven't, no. Okay. Um, I think there was actually a book uh, by Glenn Beck that I read long ago with that title. But um, essentially what it is is it's a, it's a model for understanding how um, a society will – support certain things it's basically if you think of it like picture a window you know and this is what the the most of society will accept and put up with and so what um policymakers want to do is they want to continually shift that towards their desired goals and so they they know that you know they can't just jump to you know step 10 if they're on step three or whatever of where they want to go. And so they used the, the Hegelian dialectic, the problem reaction solution, you know, not letting a crisis go to waste, things like this, um, in order to uh, shift public perception to move that window along so that now that thing that they wouldn't have accepted 10 years ago, now that fits within the window. Well, it's just, it's just like, and, you know, obviously uh, helmets are always a good idea, but, you know, back in the day when they started um, pushing bicycle helmets and then it became, you know, if someone's on rollerblades, they have to have a helmet. And then, you know, not to say that safety gear isn't a smart thing for sports, um, but it started kind of getting, turning people into the helicopter parents of nowadays. And, um with you know basically just full of fear just like uh, they were talking about on the show and once you get enough fear in the population 
and obviously COVID, when COVID came along, um, we, we saw how Americans um, responded to it. And it was probably just like they wanted it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, and it becomes very predictable, I think. Um, they, they know how most people are going to respond. You know, they, I mean, think about marketing and advertising. You know, all of that is, is, is how to create a need in someone uh, in order to say, oh, I have to have that thing or that service would really benefit my life. So they know how to um, manipulate us in that way. Um, Luke, you brought up about um, the origin of uh, the word panic. Uh, that Dr. Laura talked about. So let's do a little bit of etymology, some word study. Um, So that does come from the Greek god Pan, which again, you know, we talked about uh, many episodes ago, uh, Jesus at Caesarea Philippi um, at the foot of Mount Hermon. And right there was was Pan's temple where a lot of... um, you know, pagan worship and and awful stuff was going on. But, so, Pan, um, he was pictured as like a, I get, would you call it a satyr, I guess? A half, half human, half goat uh, being. And then, it, um, Laura mentioned that he would, let me see if I can find this in this, um, this is from uh, New World Encyclopedia website. Um, the story of Pan's birth in which his appearance causes his mother to flee in terror serves as something of an origin for this variation of fear. In the Battle of Marathon, 490 BCE, it is said that Pan inspired panic in the hearts of the Persians, allowing the Athenians whom he favored, so this was a Greek god, um, to gain the upper hand. Uh, he was also considered responsible for causing individual possession-like disruptions of the psyche, or panalepsy. Uh, he was later known for his music. You know, he's like pictured as like playing the, the pipes or flute, um, which was capable of arousing inspiration, sexuality, or even panic itself, depending on his intentions. So that's where we get the word panic. Now... I I do have to point out, because I looked this up and I couldn't find any connection to some of the other words that Dr. Laura brought up, like uh, pandemic or pandemonium. So it does seem like that use of the prefix pan has a different etymology, which means all. So if you think of like pantheist, you're saying many gods or, you know, multiple um, so I think it has a different, uh, a different origin there, but, um, pandemic, you know, being a, uh, a rapid spread or growth or outbreak, uh, pandemonium is uproar, confusion, or chaos. I think those have a different etymology from what I could find, but, but panic for sure came from, uh, the God Pan. And also, um, the doctor talked about the uh, amygdala in the brain. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes. Uh, but when we're in deep fear, uh, that's the part of the brain we use. And our uh, ability to reason and critically think is out the window, which actually tells me why, um, you know, certain very intelligent people uh, throughout our country and the world, you know, fell for, you know, the mask thing. And to me, that was that was just off the charts because with what I know from, a, I mean, you know, not to get weird or anything, but if if somebody if somebody is wearing a mask and somebody passes gas, you can still smell it. Yeah. You know, and so what that tells me, well, what that tells me is that, you know, it's not stopping a virus. You, right. Right. Yeah. It's 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 pretty silly. You look at the. Um, different health institutes that for years said it it makes no difference. And then they midstream, they change what they said. Yeah. um, Yeah. The fear part of the brain, the amygdala starts that chain reaction 
in different parts of the brain. And like you said, Don, um, you said it perfectly. The, um, the, the, the rational reasoning goes out the window window and we're kind of functioning on a more, um, primitive level. I was trying to find an article or, or a resource for this, but many, many years ago, I heard about a, a, a social experiment that was done where they had a group of people in kind of a mock house and they said, okay, here's your task. Um, they all started in different rooms in the house and, and they said in the kitchen on the counter is a key. The front door is locked. You need to go, go to the counter, grab the key and unlock the front door and walk out. And everyone obviously was able to accomplish that task. And then they did the same thing. But what they didn't tell them was um, they were they were going to be chased around by people with, you know, machetes or chainsaws or whatever. And even though they had just completed the task and the key was in the exact same position in the house, none of them could complete it. And I don't know if that's that kind of portrays it accurately, but just interesting how much fear can interrupt um, our, our rational side. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I was going to say something, but it, it's kind of off subject. Um, you okay. had talked about it earlier. It was. And Dr. Laura had, had, had mentioned something. It was a new technology that went with uh, DNA splicing with uh, CRISPR technology. And I don't remember what do – you, do you have that in your notes, uh, what that was? Um, the Human Brain Interface Project, like the nanobots. Is that the one? Like the hive Maybe mind? It was. Yeah, and, and I think she was saying you combine that with the CRISPR technology and it's just – um, I don't know. It's it's definitely Freaky. getting into the realm of tr- uh, tr- transhumanism, human two point being able to manipulate the DNA and and uh, and manufacture it. Even you know, designer babies, that type of stuff. It's like all this science fiction type of stuff is like. Yep. Oh, and didn't she bring it up in that interview? She's like, let me bring it into present day. Like, and then she named a news organization that she was watching. And right there for all the world to see. And they were talking about, I think it was the Chinese, where they were doing this type of almost like a super soldier project. And and it's like, oh yeah, this is something we, we research, something we're we're studying and doing. And 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 the kind of on that subject, the Chinese have done it. They they they're or at least it's in the experimental phase, you know, to allow the the fear that you're talking about to be diminished and they're using technology to, to the fight or flight, they're removing the flight aspect out of the soldiers. Oh. At least they're trying to, Wow, you know, where they stay up later, be able to fight longer, won't have the PTSD and all this type of fog of war type of mentality. And they'd be more focused Jason Bourne type fighters. Right. And, oh. and it's, I mean, the, the future is right in our face. It's just, well, all this science fiction stuff is, is, is happening in real time. Yeah. And that's what, when, go ahead, Don. Well, I, I was just going to say that, uh, we would welcome that first super soldier with open arms if they made him public, because if you, I mean, Captain America has already, uh, come out and I think everybody would love it and support it. And, uh, you know that that's kind of a scary thing yeah and i think i think those movies and comics are are a way of predictive programming you know give or, or glamorizing it that's what i mean yeah me as a me as a kid loves a movie and is like i want to join the military yeah i'd be willing to volunteer yeah, for that tur- program. turn me i'm going from a yeah i'm going from a skinny kid to a big yep. buff you know fighting machine i like where do I sign up? Turn me into to an X Men, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah, same here, right? Because because you yeah you see that you know Professor X and you go wow look what he was able to do and you go oh wow I just read an article that says they're doing stuff like that that sounds amazing yeah it is the human two you know Elon Musk is even talking about it 
you know, uh, combining with AI and putting our brain in the cloud and and all this sort of stuff. And I think it is it is it is that false promise of a counterfeit immortality that Satan is promising. Um, if you look at it, kind of big picture, right? Dr. Laura talking about the Nephilim agenda. That is from the beginning, Genesis six, and even the seed war, Genesis three against the serpent versus humanity, serpent seed versus the seed of Eve. Um, the human defilement is central in order to oppose God. That's So that's the Nephilim agenda. And so you have transhumanism that's gaining ground. You have the hybridization defiling the human bloodline. So they did that in Genesis 6 with the watchers mating with humans and then, you know, continual defilement in, in perhaps different ways, maybe through, you know, blood sac- sacrifice, sex rituals, how, however it's, it's speculated that maybe Nimrod uh, was able to become a Gibberim. Um, and then in maybe a more indirect way, uh, DNA that we've talked about can be altered by our lifestyle, by by sin, by confusion, such as, you know, you think of the gender confusion going on, um, generational iniquity, you know, building up, um, it, just like the, the, the breeding that goes on in elite circles where they try to keep these satanic bloodlines going because that increases the... the um, what did you call it, Luke? The iniqui- iniquity force, I guess. Yeah, even even outside of that realm, I mean, you could do the research on the the royal families, and there was a lot of inbreeding, you know, because they were so wanting to keep the family tree tight, you know, and unpolluted, you know. Um, I think there was even problems with that documented, you know, because. You know, you can't be sane and, and mentally uh, all there uh, without some mental deficiencies or physical deficiencies when you get get too, you know, primitive in, in that um, tactic. So I think I, I think the title of, of this episode was uh, dealing with the Nephilim hybrid breeding. Um, and so it you kind of touched on it and, you know, how things are different. I don't think we're going to see the Genesis six repeated in the sense that we're going to have, you know, these really tall giants. Um, it's been documented. Yeah. By survivors, by people in the UFO area, um, that these individuals are walking among us and they look like us and they could pass for humans, you know, and they're not fully human. So, I mean, I know I've taken it another angle, but it's it's not like the Genesis 6. It is because it's a manipulation of the ge- genetic code, and it is the enemy's tactic to bring about a large army to fight God, to bring the birth of the Antichrist and a one world government on the scene, but it's not, it, it's more co- covert. Sure. Yeah. Dr. Know. Laura said that um, since 1969, and I'm not sure her basis for that, but I'm, I'm sure she's looked into some degree of research. Um, she said since 1969, the hybrids look like us and they're all men apparently. Um, but I was also going to well, say. Uh, Russ Dizdar in his documentation and even pastor Doug Riggs, he says, uh, or said, uh, he's with the Lord now. Um, we're at a, at this time in 2023, he passed, I think late 21, 22, uh, we're at the fifth generation. So the first generation would have been around the time of the the Nazi power was, yeah. Okay. And so if you're looking at that first generation is up in their seventies and eighties, you know, or older. Um, no, that'd be about right. You know, if they're born in the forties, um, but then you got those that are basically elementary age right now. It would be fifth generation. Um, 
Um, so it's and and he estimated a. Uh, around 150 million worldwide wow you know that's, that's insane um and hitler was doing it so you mentioned china you know hitler wanting to have that that perfect aryan uh nordic or whatever um the super race and so she she quotes she quotes him yeah she she quotes him um in a speech to his officers and i couldn't find a link or anything to to the exact wording, so I just kind of listened to her talk about it a couple of times. But it talks about him wanting to create heroes, demigods, and godmen. And if you guys have ever looked into the etymology of the word hero, um, it does mean demigod, and from Greek heroes. Uh, which means demigod, uh, a, a variant singular of the word hero, um, perhaps originally defender, protector, um, probably a pre-Greek word. But, the, the, but again, the point is uh, the word hero used to mean what we see in Genesis 6, men of renown, yeah. right? Like like the, the mythology stories that have are tied to fact. Yes, Yes, exactly. And so that's what that was Hitler was doing. That's what the Chinese are doing. That's what um is and and I think we were talking about the social conditioning and the manipulation and the mind control. And I was me- mentioning this Nephilim agenda, right? The human defilement is the goal as an opposition towards God. So transhumanism, hybridization, the DNA being altered by our sin and iniquity. But then I also want to put in there the ultimate aim is towards the mark of the beast. And we've learned a good deal about that, talked a fair amount about that, as that not being simply some little barcode or some little, you know, grain of rice transmitter that has my, uh, you know, my checking account on it. But it's probably going to be marketed as some sort of a DNA upgrade, some sort of a evolution, continued evolution of humankind. It's it's probably going to promise some degree of Im- immortality, or it'll take care of diseases. I mean, Elon Musk just tweeted, I think today, that he's like, yeah, the mRNA technology, you know, they didn't do it quite right with COVID. It was too strong, and all these boosters are a bad idea, he says. But I, I so solidly believe that this technology could be the, the source for the cure of cancer. So they're talking about this gene, gene manipulation. So I think that Mark of the Beast is going to be a false... Um, promise a counterfeit promise of immortality because if you look at revelation it says men will seek for death and not be able to find it so so they'll literally be trying to kill themselves and they can't and um but then there's going to be those side effects right uh that revelation talks about the, all the boils or whatever that breaks out on them but i think the shaming is going to be what Luke was it Tim Alberino that kind of said this? He was like, if we have this this alien threat, for example, uh, that you you know we need to upgrade humanity to this, take this mark in order to fight this collective. And if if you don't do that, you're not on the side of humanity. So there's going to be, I think, a, a social shaming aspect to it as well. Yeah, that was that was a hypothesis or just, a, you know, a kind of a oh, it could go this way. But uh, we, we see the evidence of that with the vaccines, you know, that there was a lot of social pressure from from peers to coworkers and the, the local government all the way up with. I mean, how much money was spent by our federal government to to advertise I mean, it, whether it's TV or radio or whatever, I mean, they were pushing, pushing, pushing it. I was like, wow, you know, they just spend our tax money like it's, I mean, it's not theirs, you know, that's, <laughs> it's just unreal. Um, yeah. But 
yeah, you could see that repeated in uh, definitely uh it's an a uh, possibility. Right. Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be so overwhelmingly um manipulated in the way of how could you possibly not want to get this? Not only is it going to be an upgrade, not only is it going to promise, you know, it's going to like nanobots that are going to come in and and uh, take care of disease in different parts of your body, but you're anti-human if you don't do this. And yeah, it's not going to be just the convenience of oh, this is so great, I don't have to carry my my phone or my wallet around with me anymore. It's got all my info on there that I need to buy and sell and do everything I need to do. I think it's going to be a lot more manipulative than that. Um, so. Anyway, that maybe that's a good place to to end is with <laughs> the mark of the beast and kind of how that ties into the Nephilim agenda, uh, transhumanism, and all of this stuff. And it's, I think that's kind of what we're trying to do on the show is is formulate a a worldview that is based, hopefully not totally on fringe ideas, but understanding that you know Book of Revelation. Biblical understanding is the foundation for our worldview, and that as things were in the days of Noah, so they shall be. Yeah. Things, it, it, you know, it it really is the fulfillment of what Christ said. You know, as it was, so it shall be in the time of my return. And we're seeing these things being available, or at least the 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 first version or second version or whatever version they happen to be on the technology is 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 right at the doorstep you know if not already here to f- to fulfill these these scriptures um and we've never previous generations can't say that you know as bad as it was a hundred some years ago going through the Spanish flu World War One World War Two and all that stuff. The rebirth of Israel hadn't taken place yet, so there wasn't that fulfillment, and they didn't have the technology to fulfill the revelation stuff that we're talking about. I mean, here we here here we are. We're we're the, the last generation. It seems like it does. It does, and I think I think it's a matter of well, God God obviously being sovereign, right? But I think it's a matter of how much is Satan going to try to delay things in order to build up his army and and get more Nephilim hosts, people that are um, not necessarily genetically altered, but are on the side of of the Nephilim agenda, and and then God's you know long suffering and patience with not wanting anyone to perish, and you know getting the gospel out to. To every creature, um, gosh, I, I listen to so many things during the week. I forget the source of some of these things, but but one of them was, you know, the the scripture about, you know, uh, every eye will will see and every knee on the earth and under the earth shall bow, and the, and the person I was listening to said, "Who has knees under the earth?" Unless yeah. you're in an underground place. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. There's there's things and people under there. Well, it, it, it's, yeah. even, it's even described uh, when the plagues are taking place in Revelation, um, the judgments, that there are going to be people, and not everybody's going to have access. It's not going to be to the middle class, per se. But they're going to go to the caves. They use the term caves, but... A cave is an entrance into a hill or a mountain or an underground something, right? So if those are already there, which we know they are, those are going to be used when, on the surface, there's all this calamity. I'm going to go where I perceive is my bunker, my safe place, but you can't, you can't run and you can't hide, you know, and your knee will bow even down there. That's right. You know. That's right. Yep. Well, it's a it's a privilege and an honor to uh, to to serve the God over all of that stuff. And um, you know, He's letting it play out to some degree. You know, He's not interrupting our free will, even as as bad as some of these things that are going on are. 
Uh, but he's going to deal with it. It's it's uh, Babylon, you know that that ancient uh, evil uh, around the world, and he's going to deal with it. So, all right. Well, I think we'll wrap up with that, guys, and um, look forward to uh, to talking with you again next time. And actually, um, if you recall, we're having Tim Bentz coming back this coming week so uh look forward to talking with him maybe a little bit more about the uh gatekeepers principle i think i wanted to get some some examples about that um and that was very uh edifying to have him on last time so with that uh th- thanks for uh tuning into the days and all podcast everyone we appreciate you listening uh don't forget to like share and subscribe please follow us on your favorite podcast platform And we will see you next week. God bless. Try not to burn the bacon. We're not recording yet, are we?